On September the 15th of 2022, Vitalik Buterin changed the rules of the game for the entire cryptocurrency market by literally smashing up the market for video card manufacturers. But what happened? Well, Ethereum changed the very foundations of its blockchain. Some journalists and bloggers called it a revolution, others the collapse of mining farms and the beginning of the crypto winter. But this is all not entirely true. Actually, it's not true at all. My name is Bradley Peake, and today I'm going to tell you what you really need to know about the merge. Ethereum developers have been talking about what will happen on September the 15th of 2022, almost from the first days of the platform's existence. Back in 2013, two years before the official launch of the network, Buterin spoke about the shortcomings of the proof-of-work consensus algorithm, but he was forced to use this approach for investment reasons. Ultimately, this is how the most successful cryptocurrency of the time, Bitcoin, worked. Projects that used a different consensus algorithm, specifically proof of stake, didn't enjoy such popularity. Peercoin, Next, or Blackcoin? Tell me honestly, have you ever heard of them? Well, most investors hadn't either. And therefore, the creators of Ethereum decided to take an unusual step. They launched their platform on a popular but problematic algorithm in order to quickly gain a user base, and then only move to the system of a more advanced technical solution. This is actually reminiscent of the methods involved when treating congenital heart defects. Surgeons prefer not to perform complex operations on newborns. I mean, their bodies are still too weak. Therefore, such patients are given time to grow up and gain strength. But they also can't really delay the intervention too much. A sick heart does not allow the body to develop normally. The success of the entire treatment depends on choosing the right moment to act. So to what extent did the creators of Ethereum manage to choose the right moment? Well, to answer this, you need to understand why the proof of work principle is a bit shite. The principle of proof of work appeared a dozen years before the first cryptocurrencies did. In 1997, a young cryptanalyst, Adam Back, developed an anti-spam algorithm. The low costs involved in organizing bulk emails resulted in inboxes quickly clogging up with hundreds of intrusive emails. Adam basically suggested an algorithm that would artificially increase the costs involved when sending emails. To do this, before sending any letter, it was necessary to perform complex mathematical calculations. If they were executed correctly, the letter could be sent. The calculation algorithm was chosen in such a way that it couldn't be simplified or accelerated. The results, however, were extremely easy to check. The system was called Hashcash and was the first implementation of the proof of work principle. Hashcash was the first successful attempt in limiting the digital copying of information. You see this dollar on screen? Well, in the real world, I can only use it once. If I buy something, I will give this dollar to the seller and I'll never be able to spend it again. With all my power and might, I can't spend more than this one dollar. I can't copy money or pay twice, right? But imagine what would happen if I could pay with a digital photograph of this banknote. One picture, and now you can spend it as many times as you like. The more purchases I make with this photo, the richer I'd become. And for the same reason, I actually wouldn't be able to buy anything at all because the sellers themselves can copy this photo and, well, use it as many times as they like. Simply, the ease of copying has led to the fact that this object has no value whatsoever. For the cost to appear, the number of objects must be limited. And this is called the concept of digital scarcity and is the basis of digital money. For many centuries, money was valuable in and of itself. Coins were minted from expensive metals, right? The harder it was to get the metal, the more expensive the coin was. It's simple. If the streets were paved with gold, it wouldn't be a symbol of wealth, right? In real life, to get a couple of grams of gold, you have to process more than a ton of rock. If you're wearing a wedding ring like me, right? then know that it took one railroad car of ore just to make it. And similarly, the cost of computing power turns ordinary files into digital money. Significant efforts have been spent on obtaining them, so the number of such files is limited by the power of computers connected to the system, and they themselves become the equivalent of gold coins. Now, Bitcoin is a little more complicated, but the essence remains the same. To prove the correctness of payments in the system, a reliable confirmation of the calculations performed is used. But why is this system so shite? <laughs> well, first of all, it's horrendously environmentally unfriendly. While engineers are fighting for every percentage of the efficiency of windmills or solar panels and environmentalists are calling for calculating the carbon footprint of every purchase, 
Millions of miners around the world are burning energy for meaningless calculations. For example, in 2021, scientists from the University of Cambridge calculated that Bitcoin mining took 121.36 terawatt hours. That's more electricity than all of Argentina consumes in a year. The energy that could provide a comfortable life for 40 million people simply went nowhere. Secondly, popular crypto platforms faced the problem of the number of transactions. Any transfer of coins or tokens requires the same useless calculations to be performed. Last year, more than $11 trillion passed through Ethereum. This is more than Visa's payment system, and the number of transactions continues to grow. Thirdly, it was initially assumed that any owner of a computer could become a member of the network, but as soon as the mining of new digital coins began to bring tangible income, professional investors appeared. A huge number of specialized data centers around the world, and the only task of them was to work with cryptocurrencies. In 2012, the first application-specific integrated circuit was born, designed specifically for mining. They left the hobbyists far behind with a couple of gaming graphics cards, right? And of the 20 million GPUs, the vast majority are in the hands of big players. In addition, Ethereum has outgrown the role of a cryptocurrency. The platform's ability to conclude smart contracts has caused an increase in network load. Crypto projects, NFT art, ENS domains, and social tokens, well, these have all provided a different perspective on financial relationships in the digital world. Their appearance is comparable to the transition from gold coins to the idea of cashless payments, lending, and insurance. The demand for new financial instruments is growing, but technically, the Ethereum network can only process 15 to 20 requests per second, and therefore, it was no longer possible to postpone the solution of network problems. The Ethereum heart transplant operation was in preparation for six years, and in fact, it started only nine days earlier, on September the 6th. On this day, the Bellatrix update was released, which included everything necessary to switch to the new algorithm. So let's figure out what the essence of the proof-of-stake concept is. This algorithm eliminates the need to confirm operations using external computing resources. To add a new block, you no longer need to spend megawatts of electricity on useless calculations. Now, the guarantee is the internal values of the system, the ether itself. Instead of the computing power of the participants, what matters is the amount of cryptocurrency that is in their accounts. Depending on the state of their account, the owner can participate in a limited set of transactions. The minimum entry threshold is set at 32 Ether, which at today's rate is around $43,000. The price is pretty solid for smaller players, but it's still lower than the cost of creating a mining data center. Buterin claims that the transition to a new principle of operation can reduce electricity consumption by 99.95%. And this is already comparable to the annual consumption of Finland. In addition, the number of transactions carried out should increase by 5,000 times. But like any innovation, the transition to proof of stake has led to a whole lot of criticism. Firstly, the owners of mining farms remained out of work. They were left with tons of unnecessary equipment. It won't work to return to Bitcoin mining. Working with it is in the zone of near zero profit. Only happy owners of cheap electricity can mine new coins. It is possible, however, that the released processes can be adapted for mining some new coins, but there's greater risk of just being left with a huge pile of electricity bills as a result. Secondly, the risk of centralization is growing. Imagine that serious financial players unite in order to gain control over the platform at the expense of, well, their wallet, right? Classic mining is comparable to buying a lottery ticket. Theoretically, luck can smile on a person who bought a ticket with the remaining few dollars they've got in their bank account. But in the proof-of-stake model, the situation may arise when a rich player buys up most of the circulation and is guaranteed to receive his winnings. Do you think that that's purely a theoretical threat? Well, not really. In such cases, I like to think of the Massachusetts Cash Windfall Lottery. The usual unremarkable undertaking resulted in a high-profile mathematical scandal. Minor miscalculations in the rules of conduct allowed three teams of mathematicians to organize an attack on it at once. The groups of Can, Harvey, and Selby, well, they were making tangible profits for several years simply by buying tickets in batches. They did nothing illegal, but the organizers still had to close down the lottery. Whether the new algorithm is as good as Vitalik Buterin claims, well, time will tell. So far, the market price of Ether has only fallen slightly. But as experts say, the crypto winter is coming. My name is Bradley, this is Blockhouse, and I will see you next time.